Right, good evening. Welcome to the BPM. Um, you are listening to DJ Harvey, where tonight we discuss that very, very important subject of um, sickle cell. Now, uh, before we go to some of our speakers, uh, we've just got some information to share. Sickle cell, sickle cell d disease, SCD, is the most common genetic disorder worldwide and in the UK with 12 to 15,000 people affected um, in the UK. Approximately one in 79 babies born in the UK carry sickle cell trait. About 300,000 babies are born every year with sickle cell anemia. Most of these cases occur in Nigeria, the Democratic of Congo and India. Experts predict this number will surpass 400,000 by 2050. Um, as a patient, um, the guidance is to learn about sickle cell disease and its treatment, contact a haematologist uh, for full treatment of sickle cell anemia, contact your local sickle cell disease association. As a patient, join a local patient support group. As a friend or as a relative, Understand that individuals and families affected by sickle cell disease need support. Keep in touch and offer assistance where possible. Offer childcare or other services where possible. Donate blood. Schools. Organize awareness days, possibly June the 19th or in September, to inform teachers and staff and students. Implement accommodations for students who are absent due to illness for healthcare professionals learn more about sickle cell disease. Um, add sickle cell disease and trait information to the patient history form. Refer individuals with sickle cell trait to a genetic counselor. Familiarize yourself with the protocol of treating a sickle cell crisis. That's just a breakdown basically of um, sickle cell. Um, I am now, we are going to go to our first speaker, which let me, Michelle, let me ask her to, um, oh, sorry, Michelle. Um, there you go. I've sent a request to be unmuted. Bob, you, you can yeah. go. Good evening. Can you hear me? Absolutely loud and clear. Fantastic. Um, so thank you in the first instance, DJ Harvey, for basically facilitating this important discussion and um, got a great group of speakers and I'm very honoured to be going going first um, so I'm um, for people that don't know me Michelle Sorter the chair of the Sickle Cell Society and as DJ Harvey has just outlined it's really important that individuals affected by the condition have as much support as possible and that comes in a variety of forms including local support groups and um, family, friends, um, work colleagues, um, school, etc., and the Sickle Cell Society. So the society is a resource um, for individuals and their families. So I'm going to look to kick off today by talking about um, what sickle cell is, because I know that some people online um, are living with con the condition or familiar with it. Um, there will be others who are less familiar. And also what has been apparent to me, I've been with the Sickle Cell Society for almost 10 years, is that there is a lot of ignorance, even with people directly impacted. So there's still ignorance, there's still stigma. Um, so I'm going to do um, a, 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 a presentation and just really going through what it is and what the role of the Sickle Cell Society is. So let's have a go at sharing my screen. So let's see what happens. Let's get the right one. Um, there's two, that's, that's my one, right. So hopefully that's gonna come up on screen. Is that apparent to people? Yep, very clear. Fantastic. So let's do 
slide one. Okay, right, so what is sickle cell? Um, so with sickle cell disorder, it's also called sickle cell disease. Um, so most um, clinicians will call it a disease. Most people in the community will call it a disorder. It's really important to identify that you don't catch it. It's an inherited hemoglobinopathy condition. So you've got to inherit it and you actually inherit it through both parents. Um, the next slide will show you how that works. Um, hemoglobinopathy is another word really for blood. So it's the red blood cells molecular disorder. And your red blood cells should be round, red, spongy, carrying lots of oxygen and basically to every organ in the body. When they misfunction, they change into this sickle shape, which is where it gets its name, a sickle cell. And it becomes hard, rigid, sticky, it's not collecting oxygen, which causes this rigidity. And basically, it's like the oil of a car. You know, if your car's not oiled, everything seizes up. And damage can occur absolutely anywhere. And this takes place in what's called, again, technically, an episodic vaso-occlusive crisis. Most people will relate to it in terms of it being a severe, unpredicted pain episode. Um, so that's where it's mostly um, characterised is this pain, but it's not pain on its own. You know, the, the pain is because something is going on internally and basically it can cause serious health complications. And again, I'll go into another slide to, to show what can be impacted. During the crises, um, and even without that, there's an increased risk of contracting serious infections. So if you think about when your immune system's down for most people, you're more prone. That's even more so if you suffer with sickle cell. Um, people often hear about um, anemia, so severe anemia, lack of iron, and um, it's gonna cause shortness of breath and tiredness. Um, but it's not just, oh, I'm just feeling a bit tired. It's really, you know, um, debilitating tiredness, um, which people don't necessarily appreciate because you can look fit, well, healthy, and people don't realise what's going on internally, that your body's just not moving for you. Um, often delayed growth and delayed in puberty and sadly, um, it can reduce life expectancy. Um, less so in high resource countries, um, you know, such as the UK, um, you know, North America, where we do have treatments. Um, but again, if we're talking about where it's most prom prominent um, in Africa and low resource places, um, reduced life expectancy is a is a consequence of the condition. So <laughs> this is a really important slide. And um, so as I said before, it's inherited by both parents. So it can't just be from the mother alone. And I emphasize that because very often um, there will be blaming um, and there will be blaming, particularly from um, the father. Um, you know, I didn't have sickle. It's not me. Um, it's not my child. Um, so in this scenario, you've got two parents who have got what's called a sickle cell trait. So they might not know that they have the trait because generally, there's, there's no symptoms whatsoever. So in this scenario, they've got half a normal gene, half a trait. Um, so that's the father and the mother. And the scenario underneath is um, basically per pregnancy, what is the risk of them having um, a healthy child, a child who also carries the trait, or a child will, who will have SS, you know, with sickle cell anemia. So there's a 25% chance of them having a healthy child. So they will inherit a normal gene from the father, a normal gene from the mother, 25% of the time. 50% of the time per pregnancy, there's a risk of the child inheriting a normal gene 
and an abnormal gene. That's 50% of the time. But 25%, and here's the blower, is that they could have a child that has the full-blown sickle cell disorder. The reason why I emphasise per pregnancy is if you have four children, it wouldn't necessarily look like this scenario. You could have four children completely healthy with not even sickle cell traits, or you could have four children all who have the sickle cell disorder. So it's really important that um, particularly prospective parents um, know their um, you know, gene type um, and you know, can, can plan accordingly. Um, and even you know, before, you know, before marriage, if, if that's what they feel is important to them. So it's really important to know your genotype. Um, as um, DJ Harvey outlined earlier on, it's predominantly a Black African and Caribbean condition, but not exclusively. And absolutely, even in the UK, it's the fastest growing inherited health condition. Uh, we now believe that the numbers are up as high as 17,500 because obviously, you know, additional newborn babies and also um, migration. Um, and yes, it's the most common inherited health condition globally. So 17,500 in U the UK, it's considered to be a rare disease. But then when we look worldwide, we're talking 2 million, um, mostly in sub-Sahara Africa. So you've got that um, globe there and those red dots are basically showing you where the highest um, prominence is. And it also includes places like um, Asia, the Middle East, and Eastern Mediterranean, especially Greece. Um, but as I said, not exclusively, because it depends on where the parents are. It's not about where you're born. So again, it's um, basically through your DNA. Those health complications that I spoke about. Um, so when you think about your blood um, cells, where are they going? They are going absolutely everywhere and um, so starting you know from the top and you know most seriously is around stroke and stroke is more likely to happen actually to um, children with sickle cell so you're actually more at risk as a child for, um, of, of having a stroke and um, you know it's affecting your lungs it's affecting your heart your gold social spleens etc etc and what I say is, if you were to do, I know people are doing like the ice bucket challenge. If you were to put your hand in a bucket of ice and you're trying to see how long you can keep your hand in there, when you do it just a dip, it's nothing. When you're holding it there, the pain starts to set in. And that pain is because your blood cells basically aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're starting to get starved of oxygen and that's what's causing the pain. So if you think about that happening anywhere in your body, and again about those um, blood cells changing into that crescent shape, they can actually have blockages um, at any point. And again, that's where the acute pain is going to be felt. And people have described, and I know there are going to be guest speakers and they will be, um, describing it themselves firsthand with their lived experiences. But things which have been shared with me is that mothers have described it as being worse than childbirth. Men have described it as being repeatedly hit with an ax in various parts of the body, trickling glass through the veins. So that's the degree of pain. And if you think even about childbirth, which you know most women will be able to relate to, that doesn't happen that often in your lifetime. Even if you have six children, 10 children, imagine if you're going for a crisis, maybe six, 10 times a year. Um, and for some people it's more frequent than that. So, you know, a really nasty condition. So there are some um, medical treatments, but they're very limited. Um, so in the first instance, it's antibiotics. Um, 
not like how it's administered to most people without sickle cell like you know you can only have antibiotics if you know you've got a bacterial um and you know you can't have it for a virus for people with sickle cell they're routinely given penicillin to basically keep the ailments at bay and that's from infancy to adulthood well, our transfusions, and you're going to have Brenda Smith talking from the Give Blood, Spread Love programme. Um, blood transfusions, for some individuals, they can be requiring blood transfusions or blood exchange every three to four weeks. So some individuals may never have to have it. Some people maybe a couple of times a year, but there are a lot of individuals whose lives literally rely on blood transfusions three to four weeks, every three to four weeks. Um, pain relief, so when the individuals go into crises, um, so ibuprofen, if you're treating yourself at home, if the pain becomes unbearable, you're looking at strong opioids. And the only way of getting those is through basically A&E. So it's going to um, hospital, as an emergency and the NICE guidelines, NICE being the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, guidelines say that these strong opioids to relieve the pain should be administered within 30 minutes of arrival. Sadly, even though that, you know, the guidelines from top down, um, it's more often missed than given. And even when it is administered within 30 minutes, it's only going to last for a limited period of time. And there's no guidance thereafter to say about continuous pain relief. So that's an issue for us. There's only literally two um, drug options. Um, so hydroxyurea has been around since the, the late 90s. It was initially a cancer drug. And again, cannot be tolerated um, by everybody. And crizanlizumab, um, literally in 2021, um, it was licensed. But we, um, when I say we, the Sickle Cell Society had to lobby really hard um, with, with NICE to get it basically to be accessed by individuals. And it's currently available on a managed access basis only. So again, if there are individuals um, online who think that they would benefit from a new drug and haven't already accessed CRIS, um, they should go to, to see their health specialist to find out if um, the health specialist thinks that it would be suitable for them to try. But it's one of those things that if you don't ask, you possibly won't get. Um, bone marrow and stem cell transplant so if it's the same bone marrow and, and it's also called stem cell transplant, is curative. So the other options that I've described above are really to treat the symptoms or keep you well. Um, <clears throat> but again, it's very expensive. Um, there are risky complications um, and therefore it's only really restricted to people whose lives are so debilitated by sickle cell that, you know, they're constantly in hospital and that their life expectancy, expectancy is threatened. Um, and initially that was only for um, children with matched siblings. Um, and now that's um, again limited to, sorry, matches. And now it's to um, adults, but only if they have a sibling match. And again, we're, we're, we're lobbying um, as a society for that to be widened. Very excited about um, gene therapy. And again, there have been some um, clinical trials um, which has shown it to be curative, but hugely expensive and there are still complications. But we're really on the sort of cusp of um, genomics, gene therapy, really been a medical revolution. Um, so it's really exciting and really exciting for a sickle cell disease um, in particular. So finally, what does a sickle cell society do? Because um, very often people say, you know, what, 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 what 
do you do? What do you do? Um, so we provide an annual children's holiday, which, which might sound quite simplistic, but actually this can change children's lives at a fundamental age to give them confidence in their condition, how to look after themselves, um, meeting other children like them, providing respite for, for their parents and family. So, so really important and, you know, it impacts on their, on their lives forever. Um, very much um, lobbying government bodies um, and we provide the secretariat to sickle cell and thalassemia, all party parliamentary group. So again, it's really trying to change things top down from a legislative point. Um, representation on national health organisations such as the Clinical Resource Group, NICE Public Health England, National Institute of Health Research. So again, we're doing this um, across the UK. So we're the only um, national charity for sickle cell which covers the whole of the UK. And therefore we have that additional clout um, where the UK representative and founding member on the Global Alliance of Sickle Cell Disease Organisations. So again, we work on a global level, supporting clinical trials, producing and sharing patient education through social media, patient blogs, literature, which can be used in workplaces and schools, um, working with other charities, for example, breaking down barriers, um, we provide a mentoring programme. Um, again, it's in um, limited areas at the moment, but we're trying to get that rolled out and funded by the NHS. We provide advocacy and support via our help desk. And um, lastly, but not least, because this is going to um, lead me nicely on to, to, to Brenda, community organising blood donors from um, black and ethnic minority communities. Um, so there's a lot that we do, and we only do that on a very small um, paid workforce, probably about nine. Um, so my very last slide um, is basically, um, if you're looking to, to support the um, Sickle Cell Society, you can do that through fundraising, donations, volunteering, absolutely become a blood donor if you can. You can join the Sickle Cell Society um, membership for free, so you'll get access to literature, what we're doing. It's free to join. Um, raise the awareness, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Do tell your friends. Um, I mentioned about the all-party parliamentary group. So one of the documents we produced was the No One's Listening report. Um, which is basically telling it how it is. Um, very moving reports, um, very damning in terms of the level of service that individuals have received, particularly um, at the front door. So sort of from the call centre through to A&E. Um, if you haven't already done so, um, do read and do share and do support our events. Um, so that's... Um, that's me. I'll put the contact details in the um, chat because it's probably easier to do. And um, I will stop sharing. Excellent. F absolutely fantastic uh, presentation, Michelle. Michelle, uh, before we go to Mo, um, let me ask you a question. What would you say, first and foremost, how long have you been part of the sickle cell um i believe your chair i am so i've been um with sickle society um since 2014 and um, so not far of 10 years so it was 10 years originally i um, joined as a trustee and treasurer and um i have been in my chair post for the last last year excellent and um let me ask you a random question put you on the spot um what would you say is the most frustrating thing um, that you find in the sickle cell world? Oh, I suppose it's got to be around blood donation. It's got to be around the fact that it's not representative of us as a population. You know, brains all go into the facts, mm. but we absolutely need more, more, um, 
blood donors from black heritage and mixed backgrounds yeah. and you know to my shame um but i've rectified it i mean i didn't become a, a blood donor um until about was it three years ago four years ago um four years ago and um yeah because you're busy you're working you're busy you haven't found the time um but when i was going to it was actually um the London mayor was putting on an event at um, City Hall to attract black donors. And I was going representing the Sickle Cell Society. Well, how could I do that and not be a blood donor myself? So, you know, I, I, I did it and have been a regular donor ever since. And again, Brenda will talk about how easy it is to do. And you feel good, you feel good. So I wish I'd done it sooner. Exactly, and it's um, one of the main reasons why we are having this debate, and it will be on YouTube for everybody to see, and hopefully it will raise awareness and encourage people to do exactly that, give blood. Michelle, can I say thank you very much on behalf of the BPM? Thank you, my pleasure. None problem, thank you very much. Um, so before we go on to Merle, is Merle on? She's, uh, no, she's logged on. Um, Merle, hi. Uh, before we go to Merle, um, <clears throat> can I just say that the BPM next debate in about two to three weeks' time will be on domestic violence. So, if you have any friends or associates um, who would like to be on the panel of the BPM debates, domestic violence, could you please contact me directly? Um, on email and the number which will be posted in in the chat um, in the next few minutes so the next BPM debate will be on domestic violence the BPM the debate closes at 10 30 this evening and then from 10 30 until 11 we play music until 11 o'clock um, now before we go to Mo Denise good hi everyone hello hi. what has been going on in the zoom chat in the Zoom chat, in the comments, um, Torquase has said, as a blood donor, women can only give three times a year. A man can only give four times a year. So you can weigh up the need for more black people to give blood. Sickle cell fighters need the blood to come from their own ethnic background to be beneficial for them. Excellent. And uh, I believe there's a few other comments. Uh, I think most of them are regarding Michelle's uh, uh, presentation. presentation. Absolutely. Interesting and informative presentation. Comments. Thank you, Michelle. So there's lots of thanks and praise for a wonderful presentation. Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much. Right. Mo. 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 Good evening. Uh, let me Enjoy ask. Harvey and everyone. Hi, hi, um, well, good evening. Welcome to the BPM. Thank you, and thank you for allowing me to take part. Not a problem. Okay, so um, you've uh, you've got your you've got to follow Michelle, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you're up. And um, yes, um, uh, you could start, and uh, away you go. Okay, just getting my slide up. So, yes, yeah, we can yeah. see it. Yep. That's great. First and foremost, just introduce yourself um, uh, regarding your background. Okay. So I'm Mal, Mal Blaine, and um, as it said on the poster, that um, I'm a retired practitioner. So I've done various jobs and now no longer doing so. So currently just completing PhD, so completing that. So that's me really. So what I'm going to present is uh, some of the results from my PhD, for my research on employment experiences of black women living with sickle cell, SCD. So imagine you go to bed tonight 
And just before you fall asleep, you start to feel a niggling pain in your body. You try to ignore it and hope it will stop. You take some painkillers and drift in and out of sleep. In the morning, you're anxious to get to work and make your way on the bus, then on the train. The pain has not gone. It gets deeper and more profound. It begins throbbing. Then all of a sudden, you experience even more severe, chronic, excruciating, throbbing pain worsening all over your body. You know what's happening. And you sit down at the bus stop, take some pain medication. You know it's not going to work. You can't even move. You can't hide your pain. The tears flood down your face. You feel embarrassed in this public place where you have no control. Someone calls the ambulance. You end up in hospital for two whole weeks. This is an experience of the women in my study in a sickle cell crisis experienced at any time by the participants trying to work. So sickle cell effects, as Michelle has said, 15,000 people in England and more. This chronic condition sickle cell is the most common genetic condition to be born within the UK mainly affecting black minority groups. As Michelle has informed us, complications include mild pain to chronic pain, organ failure, strokes, blindness, and more. Persons with the disorder are largely unemployed. However, people with the condition are also in all types of professions. So for example, they're in medicine, so they're doctors, they're teachers, they're solicitors, they're social workers. Research on the condition has mainly been from a medical, scientific, mental health perspective. The research has actually been minimal on sickle cell on its crisis and the impact on individuals' lives. And further research has been suggested to, set, to gain more insight. However, there's been no research found on black women, sickle cell and employment from a black women's perspective. And I, as a black woman, I'm aware that black women's voices are rarely heard. They experience oppression, discrimination, racism, as Crenshaw and Patricia Hill and other scholars have said. Furthermore, there is a lack of research on black women by black women because research is usually written from a white male's view, neglecting women's issues and looking at numbers. So not always about emotions and the women's issues. My research gave black women with sickle cell disorder a voice. By exploring their experiences through their own stories and sharing their meaning using an interpretive analysis method, which interprets and analyzes. And this is known as IPA, which is Interpretive Phenomenology Analysis. So to do this, I recruited 10 black women living in England, aged 18 to 60 plus. They were either employed, unemployed, looking for work, and they had sickle cell. 
they re recruited and interviewed using the same questions for each person. And then the interviews were digitally recorded. Some of the questions are, I asked them were things like, did you yeah. disclose you had sickle cell disorder to your employer? One of the responses from one of the women was, no, I didn't want to be stigmatized. And they don't understand. This sentiment was echoed by um, a lot of the women in the study. Questions were also open-ended. So in this case, they was able to expand on the information they were giving me um, and give me more detail. All the responses that were given were written up, interpreted and analyzed by myself. The interviews range from two and a half to four and a half plus hours. So I had a lot of work to do, but it was worth it. I had some fantastic information. The findings, these came from their stories. And with this, I identified common themes. And this included six themes altogether, such as a theme of undesirable experiences in work and employment and health. And under this theme, for example, all the, all the participants had commented on the uh, long working hours and overworking and having a heavy workload and feeling very pressured, which impacted on their SCD. That was a lot of the women who said this. One black woman, for example, explained, and I quote, I worked a 14 hour shift sometimes. It was quite a pressured job. Sometimes you had to work nights, which was even worse. Doing a 14 hour night shift. I couldn't have done this long term. So this woman with sickle cell get very fatigued and tired, quite exhausted. So you just couldn't manage the job. So she would went on to uh, find other work so she could continue to be employed. Another woman spoke about a time when she got stranded and had to call her manager. At this time, she was work doing her job and working. There were no trains and it was freezing cold. She was outside and so cold that she called her manager to ask her what she could do. And the response she got from her manager was, as I quote, you can just wait around until you know, maybe the buses that come in place of the trains. She said, you can just wait around till that comes. And I just thought, that's so disgusting. So this black woman, we know with sickle cell, well, if you don't know, with sickle cell, the environment temperatures, hot and cold, can actually exacerbate your, the condition and cause a crisis, which is the excruciating pains. And this participant was aware that this was about to happen to her and just was not pleased with the manager. Another woman said, and I quote, sat me when I was at my most vulnerable. So I think that was very eye-opening for me. And I think after that employment, I told all my employers that I had sickle cell. Well, a lot of the women did uh, shy away sometimes from talking about their sickle cell and disclosing, which obviously is their choice. But when incidents happened, um, eventually they informed manager like this particular woman. Another theme was living with SCD, the impact 
and lack of understanding of work in the workplace. And with this theme, one woman, and I quote, said, a lot of people don't know about sickle cell and you can't even see it. It's even harder trying to prove that you are capable of something and you're trying to prove yourself. You know, explain that you have this illness when the person doesn't even know about it. It's not considered an illness because it's not an illness that they know or affect their kind. So this black woman was not happy again with issues around sickle cell and knowledge people that she had and who she felt that she had sickle cell. One of the other themes was harassment and discrimination. And under this theme came like sexual harassment and racism, policy protection and so on. So I quote for this woman, said, the racism in elderly white British people was, oh my God, phenomenal. I was called a black cow. I was called the C word. Mm, you know, I mean, we were the only black girls. I mean, they picked on us. So this black woman, in the early times in her employment, she faced a lot of this experiences. But as she went through employment, she actually grew more confident and was able to not only face the challenges, but support herself. And under this other theme around the policy protection, uh, this one black woman had stated, I had actually filed a legal case because I had the evidence, I wanted to file a legal case. They were the only company that I had told that I had sickle cell and they were the only one that I got the most grief from. So again, that was difficult for um, the black women. That was this particular black women's experience, but some of them also had that when they did actually um, divulge their condition and still had some difficulties. And what happened is that I obtained so much rich information that was conclude what that was got from the black women's stories um, that informed the study and I'm so grateful that they were involved because these things can't happen without them. However, in conclusion, the themes revealed deep, profound insights into the black women's employment experiences, living with sickle cell disorder and taken together through their own recollection of their stories, the participants face many challenges. Being black, female and disabled, although all participants didn't identify themselves as disabled. This was significant because it affected what type of career that the black women decided to pursue, whether they revealed their health condition or whether they remained in employment. So the results suggest they enjoyed employment when they were supported. However, they did face many challenges. Nonetheless, the in-depth accounts provided a greater understanding of the black women's experiences living with sickle cell. So I want you to move forward and talk a bit about latest research. I know Michelle has touched on certain things already. So I'll still just say the points. 
So although um, over the years, you know, medicine has been slow to respond to uh, SCD, but since I began the research that I did, um, there's been many, many changes and advances as what, what's happened, which has been absolutely fantastic in the UK and across the world. There have been significant um, advantages. So in England, in 2021, the NHS and Health and Race Observatory appointed a sickle cell expert as part of tackling ethnic health inequalities. This was an absolute breakthrough as well. And inter interestingly enough, it did follow the publication of the report, No One's Listening, what Michelle uh, mentioned, by the All Parliamentary Group and Sickle Cell Society. And also, there has been several research papers on gene therapy, and one currently pending. Furthermore, the uh, University of York had been awarded £2.3 million for research into stem cell gene therapy, working with um, others on a two-year project. So it'll be fantastic to hear about that. But perhaps the most significant breakthrough has been the new drug treatment in the over 20 years for sickle cell, for Zamabab. I know that might not be said correctly. However, this prevents reoccurring sickle cell crisis. Um, but not all sickle cell patients are actually given the medicine currently because it's still, it's been given by managed access, managed access. While it, um, while being agreed by the um, NHS England and the Vartis Drug Company and more evidence being collected. Because the original trial anyway was quite small. So we still need to actually um, get some information before it would ever be funded routinely for people with sickle cell. And actually, it's not going to be known the outcome until 2025. So we've got a few years yet to find that information out. Finally, there has been a report on sickle cell and employment um, in 2020. This actually shone some light on um, sickle cell. But currently, individuals are still being impacted by the sickle cell in their employment and having difficulties there, as evidenced in my study. So my study is focused on black women. So this has uh, assisted in towards further knowledge and understanding of experiences of um, people and black women with sickle cell. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. And thank you very much to all those people who are doing so much hard work, working with people with sickle cell and keep up the good work. And all those fantastic black women I, work, I have interviewed for my study because without them, these things won't happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mo, Mo, can I ask you a question? Um, how frustrated must it be um, to raise awareness for employers in the workplace to understand and recognize and, uh, and uh, know more about it? Because it seems as though it's a, it's a very frustrating infrastructure in the workplace. Yes, in employers, it, it can be difficult, but the thing is, is having still knocking on the doors to um, disseminate this information so that they have the, the knowledge, the information, and they can support individuals in work so they can actually remain. I mean, the women I spoke about, and there was so much rich information coming out that it was just amazing but some was quite shocking as well i hope um as time goes on and more research comes out you know um more can be done and uh 
employers will take notice. I think there's some changes and indeed there has been lots of different changes since the COVID-19 happened because then lots of things changed as we know the working from home for example so that was really fantastic for some of the black women in my study to have done that as well um and for many other people um so you know and understanding that sometimes you have to change the rules to make it better for others happy happy workforce thanks man. well once again as i said on behalf of the bpm like to say Thank you very much for your presentation. I believe you're still sharing a screen. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. much Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, before we go to Shane, um, can I just say that um, the BPM does encourage you that if anybody wants to have a comment, um, ask a question, personal experiences, then please feel free to uh, put your hand up virtually on Zoom or just private message me, or just openly um, ask the question in the Zoom chat. You're very much encouraged to take part. And um, I could quite clearly see in the Zoom chat, there was quite a few people who have got very in-depth knowledge. So like I said, please feel free if you want to have your say. Now, before we go to Shane, Denise, what has been going on in the Zoom chat? myself okay we've got portia and she says that she has the thalassemia trait and has been told that because she's anemic um she's not eligible to donate and also that she's too old when she hits 60. that will be very I interesting because obviously brenda um she's listening um in the background i'm sure that she's absorbing some of these questions because we would obviously like to know exactly what the situation is regarding giving blood and when you can and when you can't and when you do qualify when you don't qualify yeah sorry um yeah what else has been going on in chat well Terquasi said you can donate up to the age of 70 and above if you are in good health okay um because it affects mainly black people it was less important um people suffer and had to fight to get it recognized and they're still fighting and michelle has put um, some resources in that as well as some comments and maybe she wants to talk about the resources that she put there michelle and um, yes yeah, so just really to, to to say there is help out there and um, thank you mel that was really really you know, moving um, for those that are familiar with those stories and those that that, that that are not. And there's too many. I mean, there was 10 women, but we know that, you know, of the 17 and a half thousand, half of them are likely to be women and a, too, too significant a number will relate to that. So it's really, um, so one of the resources was around um, sickle cell and work and employment and um, as it as a resource um so the link is there because obviously individuals do have rights um i will also add our general um advice link um it, because again we are there for those kinds of of calls and, and situations and we will try and advocate um where we can um so yeah it goes back to you know what we said as far that it's a really difficult condition to live with but also the purpose of today's debate and um, you know Emil's presentation as well you know we are looking to change things we are looking to support you so we don't want people to be suffering alone uh, there's a question in the chat from Emma how is sickle cell disease research funded um, if we're talking generally funding, um, it, so there's there's two streams really. So so there is funding, you know, by the NHS, um, as it would fund, you know, research into you know many other conditions. The question is really, are we on the par with other conditions? Um, and pharmaceutical would also do funding into research because obviously they're looking at, you know, successes down track and obviously their their business model. Um, but to put a, a, a comparator out there, 
Um, so we've got 17,500 people with sickle cell disorder. Cystic fibrosis is probably about 12,000, so probably about a third. Most people are common, um, are, are more familiar with cystic fibrosis. That includes the medical profession. And in terms of um, every pound that comes in for sickle cell, 33 pounds is generated for cystic fibrosis. And you've seen that we've only got a handful of treatment options, only two of them are drugs, and the others really stem cell and gene therapy are so infrequently used as to dismiss. So given our handful of options, there's probably about 330 treatment options for cystic fibrosis. So the question isn't really how we funded, but why are we not funded on an equitable scale? And this is where the um, health inequalities and Mel mentioned about the um, Health and Race Observatory really come into play to be challenging what has gone in the past, because without doubt, it has been an issue of colorism, but things are changing. Things are absolutely changing. So we need to be positive about the future. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Uh, one last comment from uh, the Zoom chat to Denise and then we'll go straight to Shane. Um, okay, Elridge has just said that his experience is that um, he was diagnosed with sickle cell trait at age 70. Wow, okay. Um, when my GP wondered why I was frequently testing borderline diabetic, it was found specifically and looked for during a fasting lipid blood test. Shouldn't a regular lipid blood test have found this? Right, I will leave that for um, one of the speakers, the latter part of uh, the show. Very, very interesting question um thank you very much denise we'll come back to you later on in the show uh before we go to shane somebody asked how do you subscribe well you know what just before the show started i've got into uh youtube and i've and i've literally asked youtube how do you create a clickable link and literally <laughs> two or three minutes i think the link in the zoom chat is it Basically, if you click it, hopefully it's going to work and hopefully it will take you to subscribe to the BPM YouTube channel where this show will be recorded, uploaded and be available in the morning. Shane, good evening, sir. Good evening, DJ Harvey. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for having us on this platform and, you know, giving us the chance to just gain more knowledge on such a topic uh such this this such topic but um yeah so i wanted to thank michelle as well for what she was talking about and just wanted to let you know that the trips that you are doing for the youngsters yeah it's because um, i was born with sickle cell and those are things that i vividly remember and um so yeah they're they're quite important just you know to get gain a sense of reality and out of hospital and all of those things but anyway, my name is Shane. Um, I was born with sickle cell. I'm 33 years old. And yeah, so I want to talk more about the holistic side of things and how to just uh, kind of stop a lot of the symptoms or even subside some of the symptoms of sickle cell. So it was only two to three years ago that I started actually taking my health in my own hands and doing a lot of research now. Imagine as kids with sickle cell, we was introduced to codeine from so young, pre-teens, and that has a major effect. Imagine growing up and that's what you have to take for your pain. Um, as I say, I'm 33 years old, so it's about two and a half, two years, three years ago that I decided that I needed a change because there's too many side effects and there weren't really much answers in regards to what next. It was always just up in your painkillers, take more painkillers and that's not really a quality of existence that I wanted to be involved in. So I started researching the human body uh, about the endothelium system and how blood flows and what actually affects us and what certain things cause crisis and how pro crisis even form like that the sickle shape, the shape of a sickle, which is like a half moon crescent and how that just forms within the body. 
So uh, during my studies, I came across, you know, the diet, which kind of surprisingly isn't something that's mentioned a lot, a lot when you go to your appointments or whatever, when you're consulting with uh, people who, you know, they're supposed to actually be looking after you. But um, yeah, so once searching the diet and realizing that certain animal based products was so first of all, I want to say that this was what helped for me. This is what helped my journey. And now I now have three other clients who have sickle cell and it's now helping their journey. And I'm video recording the testimonies, but this isn't to go against any of the medical advice. So um, by researching certain things and taking into account what I can do for myself to benefit myself. So it was the diet at first, removing a lot of dairy, which as um, you may know, forms a lot of mucus within the blood. Now, animal products also damage the endothelium system, which is how, you know, we just, uh, how our blood flows and how we stay consistent with health. And so I started looking at that and realizing, okay, and also artificial sugars. So just taking those things out of my diet. By doing so, I did see a minor change over time. Now it took a while, but um, I'll say about two to three months, I started seeing the benefits of it. And by doing so, <clears throat> I also incorporated certain other aspects, which was uh, looking at the mind and in regards to the blood and, and autoimmune illnesses and then amino acids. So we have things that are antioxidants. And when you're looking at antioxidants, one of the um, strongest ones, one of the ones that has the most benefits is something called glutathione. Now, that obviously an antioxidant protects the cells. So do, by doing research, I was thinking, OK, so the breakdown of cells is what kind of causes sickle cell. So by matching the two together and realizing if I up these kind of things within my system, I should see a benefit because it's protecting my cells. So by doing so, we doing a lot more research and seeing what how I can up that particular antioxidant. And so there's certain things which are precursors to it. So to make glutathione in your system, you need something called glycine, um, glutamine, and NAC, which is, um, is cysteine based. So to get these things, you have to, to get glutathione, you have to kind of look at those things first. So I started doing a lot of research anyway. Now in two, two, this is like two to three years later, I'm, I've stopped taking these painkillers. I've stopped taking the things that were just slowing me down because imagine having to take painkillers for so long. I used to have to visit the hospital weekly, take painkillers almost every day. And it was just hindering my life. Wasn't able to do much, always tired and all of those things. So that's why I took that drastic change to realize that I had to make change. But one thing that was so key as well is whilst doing these changes is getting con um, regular blood tests just to know and see the levels, actually see how it's altering my, my makeup. And by doing so, I was able to pinpoint certain things that I can change and I should change and, and and some things that I don't need to change because it's already in a good balance now with sickle cell when you're in a state of crisis and you're not feeling well it's it comes down again to also the cells and and being deficient in certain minerals so once you can actually find out these things and know what you're deficient in that's when you can start make to start to make the changes. So the three sicklers that I'm working with, three people who suffer from sickle sickle cell, I get them to take regular blood tests, and we do a a, a whole suite of their lifestyle because it's not just diet. So what I'm going to come to also now is the mindset. So what helped me is during COVID times, I've always wanted to be, uh, I've always wanted to access the ability to meditate. And it took me a while before I was able to do so. And in 2020, I was able to, okay, realize, yes, I now have a blueprint down that actually helps me. So by doing so, I was able to calm my mind, get rid of the victim mentality of 
asking why me because you know you can get into that state when you're all when you're always in pain always in and out of hospital it's easily to go to go to go to the senses of why me and why is this happening and by flipping that to more of a gratitude standpoint I truly believe that also helped me because you you what you look for is what you find so if you're always in a negative standpoint then you're going to see more of the negative side of things of life so when I saw more of the gratitude and just the benefits of what I do have, and I'm grateful for it, that made a, a huge change. It really did. It made a, a huge change. So um, anyway, so mindset in regards to linking it up with the heat, with the body is key. You can't just do one without the other. And it is a, it's a long battle, but it can be done because even the hospitals are, that I used to attend are asking, what have I actually changed? And how come things are this different? And um, I'm do actually doing a talk in, at Homerton Hospital on the 16th regarding it to a bunch of people. And um, so what I done, majority of this change, I can put it down to a few things. So it's mindset, diet, herbal intake is very key and algae as well. Some people pronounce it algae, some people pronounce it algae. So things that come from the sea, which are highly dense with minerals and vitamins so for instance something like sea moss now when you break down sea moss and you prepare it it's um its consistency is similar to our cytoplasm within ourselves within ourselves and, and that's how it actually affects the cell it actually boosts us and gives us the minerals and vitamins that we need to not be mineral deficient and so the, the antioxidants that I was talking about before, they work in, uh, so, so it's like a team thing, like a, a lot of the things within our bodies need to be there. So for instance, you need to have a good level of vitamin B6, you need to have a good level of B12. And they say you can only get the majority of how you get B12 is through meat. But that is now um, not, 100% the case so for instance not even just sicklers I've had few people so I help people with high blood pressure as well and they're heavy meat eaters but their doctors have told them that they need to have b12 injections now that comes down to the fact that the soil the soil that things are made in, made from and all of that so the animal will eat the soil and then the b12 is is now within the animal's dna but if the animal's eating from soil that's depleted of minerals you're not really going to get the minerals that you require and need. So this is why I heavily would say that uh, supplementing is, is very key also. Because when you can have a, a decent level of B12, B6, you need vitamin D3, as we know. And um, obviously, when you're darker skinned, you need more of it. So being in England, you're hardly going to get uh, enough sun from enough vitamin d from the sun because the sun's not really shining like that so and when you're even taking vitamins and supplements it's very important to um we'll look at the ingredients because in a lot of the vitamins like for instance even in maybe i shouldn't yeah so even in even in places like holland and barrett they have a high number of of ingredients within their vitamins to, to keep it cheap so for instance, one of the things that they use is titanium dioxide, and that's been shown to worsen cells within someone. Um, the European Union has um, in certain places have banned it, but it's still it within certain vitamins. So you have to look at the quality of the vitamins that you're taking. It can't just be any vitamin. And you have to do a lot of research to see if, if um, there has been a funding behind it to actually research it to say, that what is in this vitamin is actually in this vitamin and as I said taking a lot of blood tests um when you when you know like about every two to three months I'll say take a blood test and some GPs have been a bit hesitant but you know when you're adamant and you know that you want to look at your cells and what's within you so you can correct it and have a better quality of existence that's what's key that's it's, it's so key because no one wants to be on painkillers for the rest of their life or always taken and I'm not saying this is drastically it's, it's erased my sickle cell no and even saying what I just said there is wrong 
erase the sickle cell. So I, so I shouldn't even be saying my sickle cell because it's not mine. It's, it's, it's another thing is a terminology and the things that we say and speaking things into existence as well. And it's a daily practice. Um, I'm practicing this daily. I'm, I'm constantly trying to learn things and certain that along this journey, I'm going to be able to help myself even further and help people who have come to me because I, I've made it. Um, it's, it's something that's very close to my heart because suffering from sickle cell and, and having to go through certain things, even through school and not being able to attend certain GCSEs, having to take it in hospital and all of those things. It, and just to imagine someone else having to go through and even worse as well. Though, yeah, um, that's, that's my aim really, to change those kind of things. So once that's able to be done and it's a daily practice is what I'm saying, it can't just be like, okay, cool, today I'm going to try something and then yeah maybe tomorrow um the day the day will come tomorrow and then maybe you fall off and I'm not saying you can't have anything that you enjoy because life is about enjoyment however everything in the moderation and it's about just wanting to make that change like switching and being okay cool I'm, I'm kind of fed up of not having an answer to actually succeed and even with a workplace like just being able to work now being able to know that I can go to colder climates and not suffer as much as I would have suffered and, you know, just do, do, do more things that I like to do without having to worry so much about um, pains and all of those things. Now, I'm not saying I never get pains because if you're work, if you're, if you're always busy and, you know, you're, you don't have time to rest, you might get little, um, you know, little niggly pains in your joints and all of these kind of things. But, when I do, which is hardly now, and it's been a, such a drastic change, when I do, my painkiller now is teas, herbal teas. So for instance, when I, if, if um, I'm very busy throughout the week and I'm unable to schedule in a rest day in my calendar and I might start feeling a bit fatigued, perhaps on the eighth or the ninth day, my tea is a mixture of ginger, turmeric, something called mistletoe, which is has high... Um, anti-inflammatory ingredients within this whole tea so ginger mistletoe turmeric uh clove and so by combining all of these things and taking it and it's also about the intention like we are very powerful human beings and i've only started to notice that like the last year and the year before that when you set intention and you know that this is what you want to do for instance even just doing these kind of talks it's, it wasn't something that I saw that I could do. And I have something in my boss pass now, which is my goals and my set plans. And I put it in my boss pass about two months ago. And when I, I, every time I take my boss pass out, I'm reading it. I'm reading it with intention. So with intention means to see yourself in that exact moment before it actually comes. You, you feel it. You're actually feeling the moment. And when you set these things in your mind, like let's say for instance for example you see yourself being able to travel pain-free and not having to take your painkillers and all of that but you're also doing the action to make that a not just a possibility but a fact a reality when you're taking the action for it it's incredible what you can actually do and me myself I'm not speaking for everyone but I believe in a higher creator and just my, um, when I meditate, I speak with my creator, I speak with my energy. I don't know if that sounds a bit weird, <laughs> but yeah. So just being able to know that there's a higher, a higher power speaking things into in existence and taking the action. It's not like, oh, I wish this was whatever, whatever. And then just letting it be and saying a prayer or something and being like, our creator will provide we have to kind of take the action we have to take the first step and by doing so is what has drastically changed my quality of existence and people have seen so and that's how I actually started formulating the business because I first started taking people on free and helping people but it was getting a bit costly for me now I'm doing a bit of I'm doing a few consultations I also sell uh um kind of products so CMOS products CMOS based products that really 
build the immune immune system and build ourselves and feed us the minerals and vitamins that we need. Now I'm taking on as much free people as I can, that it's not just going to be making me broke and come out of my pocket. But um, people that I don't know and strangers, uh, um, there is a cost for it. But whoever is even in this chat and wants to know a list of all the things that I take, I will happily send it to you. I'm not, I'm not talking about no charge or anything. Just contact me. I'll put my Instagram um, in the chat. I'll put, uh, yeah, my health Instagram, my health-based Instagram. And then you can message me, DM me, anything that you would like. And I will give you the information. And so what's key as well is detoxing because all, imagine all throughout our lives, we've been taking these painkillers, taking these things, which have just added so much uh, toxicity to our system that how, how, when do we get it out? Because if you keep adding on top, adding on top, adding on top, it's, it's you know, that's when um, organ issues start to evolve. So it's about detoxing with certain roots like dandelion and fruits as well bilberries and there's certain things that there are peer review studies also on these things that show that they really help there's peer review studies on CMOS and CMOS gel and glutathione which is um a key amino acid and you know there's there's things that show so for instance there's even a tablet of glutamine that they've been doing a study on and how it actually helps sickle people with sickle cell so there, it's, it's not, this isn't just coming from me. These are things that I've really studied. I've taken the time out to study and make it a goal of mine to increase my quality of existence and then in turn increase others and help whoever I can. And, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really important to just keep taking the blood test and, and seeing what action is actually happening whilst you're trying to alter certain things. So um, it's helped me with my sleep. Uh, I used to struggle with sleep as well. So um, it's like an, it's, it's a byproduct of actually wanting to help. So if you're trying to help your sickle cell or something that you start, um, you have something else you suffer from, you will see the benefits also in another way because that's what's helped me with my sleep and things like that. And I've um, assisted people with sleep and high blood pressure as well. And so there are herbs out there that I believe there's, there's, a, for numerous things, I won't say everything, but there, there's a holistic way of going. It's just about studying it and not just taking it blindly, but studying it, realizing that there is a way because our creator didn't create us to be in pain all our life. And so there is a way forward, there is a way out and just to know that. But um, yeah, I'll keep it short and sweet. So I'll add my Instagram in the chat. So if anyone does want to ask anything, um yeah we can we can have a conversation but uh last thing i would like to add is keeping fit as well not even just on your in your body your mind has to be fit as well imagine 30, i'm 33 years old it's only been two years ago no a year and a half ago that i purposefully took uh days out where i have no sensory input and that's you no know, radio tv just in by myself and being able to meditate on my thoughts and just quiet the mind, silence the mind, because the brain is a muscle as well. So all these things that we're putting into it, imagine you're working out, <laughs> you're working out every day, many hours of the day, and you don't allow your muscles to relax. That's just going to cause so much stress and drama. And someone who suffers from sickle cell, you've already got in addition to those extra thoughts that are being programmed and sent to you via the news and this and that one thing I'll say is please stop watching the news because it's just stress and negativity but um imagine yeah. also suffering from sickle cell and that's another stress that's another thing that will be in the mind and thinking okay when I arise from my sleep tomorrow will I be in pain and will this happen and um yeah so we we need we need time to relax the mind we need time to uh boost our lymphatic system and help it to actually get rid of uh just to help us detox and by doing so we are able to lessen the stress on our cells with adaptogens which are like mushroom um by the way it's not psychedelic mushrooms it's it's mushroom <laughs> it's, it's they're called chaga reishi these are the things that I, I incorporate into my 
if not daily, then um, every other day teas. So it's about prevention as well, not just waiting until the crisis has happened to want to change and want to be like, okay, cool, let me take something to perhaps lessen the effects. It's about doing, taking stuff before this, uh, this even happens, taking stuff before you're in a worse stage and daily teas, every other day teas, uh, these things help to boost our system and adaptogen is, if you Google it, it will show that it helps the body to deal with stress. And what's the sickle cell crisis? Just your body going under stress, your body going into a state that you don't want it to be going into. Um, but yeah, I'll end it there so I don't take up too much time. But thank you so much for this platform. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate the time. Shane, that was absolutely sensational. Um, thank you. Speaking from the heart, speaking from the soul, um, the knowledge, everything was just like on different levels. Um, can I thank you, Shane, for making yourself very accessible? Um, Denise, I'm going to apologize f to you in advance because I'm going to temporarily take your role. Uh, Shane, I want to ask you, I want to take a question from the chat. It's from Florine. Florine, okay. or Florina, sorry. Florina asks, so yeah. Clearly, clearly inspired by you. Her question is, do you deliver workshops to young people? And if you don't, clearly Florina sees something in you. Yeah, so thank you for asking that. I really appreciate it. Um, so I actually done one in two uh, last year, in fact, and it was with Newham Council and it was on the dangers of sh uh, sugar. So that one wasn't specifically for sickle cell. And I done another one, which was for sickle cell, and it's talking about genome types. And it was a, to teenagers um, worrying about getting in, into relationships and the need to actually check your genome type before having a baby, you know, because you don't really want to purposefully put someone through pain and illness. Well, but yeah, I have done I have done two, but that's something that I, I'm looking to implement further in the future. Right, okay. So let me put it out there. Like, uh, this is the first time I've, interacted with you and heard an in-depth presentation by yourself yeah and i'm sure most of the platform is going to agree to what i'm going to say you have a way of speaking where people listen there's something okay. about you where they listen you've got substance you've got depth you've clearly got knowledge and you've got insight so i would yeah. strongly strongly recommend that mm -hmm. um you do more speeches because I feel as though um, you are a very inspirational figure of a man. Without thank that. you so much. That means a lot. Thank you. And um, and on that, can I just say to all the speakers, including yourself, Shane, yeah. um, after the show's finished, during the show, could you all send me all of your links, links um, to subscribe, links to your uh, Instagram, and all of those links that you send me will be on the uploaded video of today's show. It will be on YouTube. So all your links will be accessible to everybody worldwide. Yeah? It's amazing. Shane, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, DJ Harvey. And I appreciate you putting this together, man, because it's powerful. Absolutely. No, no, no. Thank you very much, sir. Like I said, um, yeah, very, very valuable presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, before we go to Brenda, Denise, what has been going on? There has been quite a bit of activity going on in the Zoom chat. There's been a lot of activity, lots of um, praise and commendations for the panel. Um, for sure, Shane, Michelle, Brenda, definitely a lot of compliments there. Um, Claire Toussaint uh, really summed it up well. Take away an action from today for yourself. How can you make a difference? It could be sharing this event, exploring the work of the Sickle Cell Society, or writing your MP, uh, which Michelle had mentioned. And um, yeah arranging to get yourself some help. And another one we have, there's a lot of info there um, on nutrition. I think uh, Michelle had also posted a lot of other links for uh, 
nutrition and contacts, uh, arranging, which I'll mention, arranging to speak with sickle cell warriors to understand their journey of life. Um, the donate blood and arrange sickle cell awareness days with your community is another um, comment. And uh, Naomi, did we want to call Naomi? Because she, Ni I Naomi has actually messaged me. She is going to comment at the end. Uh, she says that it's quite noisy where she is, but she's happy to comment perhaps at the end. So yeah, we'll have um, we'll have a comment. We will go live to Naomi. Um, Shane has put his hand up. Is that accidental, or do you want to come in? Uh yeah, no, sorry. I just saw something in the chat asking if I'm on blood transfusion. I think that was directed to me. Okay. Uh, no, I'm not on blood transfusions. Um, that's mainly because I had one when I was young and it was the wrong blood type. So it created a lot of antibodies. Now, they say I can get a blood transfusion from certain um, places like Amsterdam and, and America. And they have stopped a lot of blood if in when I if in case I did need it because there was one time I did have a bad crisis and they stopped up blood but gratefully I it's not something that I've needed due to uh the studying and herbal implementation and algaes and all of those kind of things but yeah thank you that's all I want okay, to say excellent yep yeah, no, no not a problem thank you very much um I think this is a one to, oh, and again before we go to brenda um like i said you're very encouraged to put your hand up if you do want to be unmuted and have your say then please feel free um Torquasa, your hand was up but now it's gone back down so let me know if you wish to um have your say on the bpm brenda good evening so, hi so i'm brenda and i'm from the sickle cell society's Give Blood, Spread Love project. Um, I'm a blood donor. I don't have sickle cell. I don't have the sickle cell trait. And my journey uh, to Give Blood, Spread Love, um, I'm going to tell it backwards rather than from the present. Um, so back in 1989, I gave my first blood donation. And that was the time before we had social media, Instagram, Facebook and all that kind of stuff. And I was at a London Bridge and I was on my way home and it was the rush hour and I just couldn't face the rush hour. And I saw a blood donation fan and I thought, you know what, I'll kill some time in here. Yeah, and I just walked in and said, I'd like to um, give some blood because I can't manage that rush hour business at the moment. And that's the journey of my um, giving blood, purely altruistic reasons. Sickle cell was not in my mind at all. It was just a case, oh, well, give blood and it might help somebody. So that was back in 1989. Um, I'm now giving 46 blood donations. And next month, June, would be my 47th blood donation. It's, uh, I became a volunteer um, at uh, the beginning of the lockdown. So in April, June, I think 2020, um, after seeing a, um, a, a talk about, from the Sickle Cell Society, in and out of that, I've had friends who've had sickle cell and my journey is backwards, I say, because I started with a sort of kind of really sort of flippant, casual um, attitude to blood donation. It was, you know, the, the rush hour was the worst thing for me compared to giving blood. Um, but as the year, years have gone by and in the last month, I've lost a dear friend. To sickle cell. She had a crisis and she didn't recover. So my sense of urgency and doing um, the recruitment is more personal than it's ever been before. Um, so I'm a B plus. Um, that's probably quite common in the Caribbean community, B plus um, uh, blood type but I'm not what you would call 
RO, which is a specific um, uh, type that uh, Michelle mentioned that will be predominantly found in the black community or African heritage or Caribbean. I'm going to say African heritage because I don't want to trip over calling black, Caribbean, African. I'm just going to use the word African heritage. So why I volunteer, one is I'm a blood donor. I find it quite easy, an intrusive thing to do. I believe that it has a immediate impact. I do believe I am saving lives or improving lives, and that's why I do it. Um, as mentioned, women can give the maximum a year three times, and the maximum a man can give a year is four times, simply because men build up iron quicker than women, as far as the NHS is concerned. On average though, people normally give one to two. It's exceptional people who try to give the maximum. And I'm one of those exceptional people because as the years have gone by, I've become more conscious and aware that my blood is needed. What I do want to make clear is that when you do donate blood, it's not allocated to a person with sickle cell. It's in the system and it will go to anybody who needs it at that time. So blood has a certain life shelf. Um, and as you can imagine, black people have other illnesses, cancers, operations, pregnancy, all kinds of reasons why they would need ethnically matched blood. But the purpose really is we make up maybe or between 1.5 to 2% of the blood donation community, and we need to get it up to 7%. And as I said, I made my first donation in 1989, and it was really spot the black. And I live in London, multicultured, yeah? I'm talking London Bridge, everybody is coming through there. But in that van over an hour, I was only one. And I remember that vividly because I never felt so odd. However, moving forward, there is a slight increase, but not enough. So I may see as I leave a center, I might see somebody else coming in, okay? But we're outnumbered by how many people from other groups do donate blood. And so I want to make that clear. Um, and so my motivation is to really encourage our community to come forward and to donate blood and that um, you'll be fine, you'll be okay. I know there's inequalities, but I believe that this discrete piece of active community action is something we can do. There are other bigger issues, but this discrete piece of action is, needs to come from us because the ethnically matched blood is not going to come from anywhere else to be in the system. So if I could ask Michelle to show you the first slide. So this slide um, is a slide that um, was used when I just joined Give Blood, Spread Love. And I was explaining that I use my own social media presence such as Instagram and Facebook. And I used to put up on there when I gave blood. And people used to say, oh, that's great, Brenda, fantastic, great work. And what I was trying to get is, well, don't thank me. Why don't you come and join me? Yep. And there was just silence. You know, so each time I donated, I put it up again. And they was like, great job. Or I can't donate because I've had a transfusion. Or I can't donate um, for NHS reasons. Or, 
a wall of silence. So we thought we would do a campaign saying, don't thank me, join me. Okay, if you could show the next slide. So Give Blood, Spread Love is really about raising the awareness of the sickle cell core and the need for ethnically matched blood. And that is the subtype, the RO, which is a perfect match. Um, so many people with sickle cell rely on blood transfusions to keep them alive and well. Um, transfusions are one of a small number of treatments for sickle cell. And not enough people of African Caribbean backgrounds currently donate blood. And it's still that situation since 1989, as far as I can see. Slightly better, but a huge room for improvement. Um, if you think um, if the maximum you can give, three for women and four for men, and if you think on average, actually people give one or two times a year, and then if you think about people having to have transfusions every four or to six or eight weeks, you can see how much blood that needs to be in the system. Can I have the next slide, please? So it's around 250 blood donation a day is needed to treat people in England. 250. And unfortunately, we're only or just making half of that. And I just want to pause there because I want really people to sort of hear that. Think about it, 250 blood donations as needed per day. And we as a community are just about making half of that. And one of the things that happens when you do donate, the NHS are trying as much as they can to encourage people to donate. So a new thing or a recent thing is you get a text message telling you where your blood's gone, maybe two or three weeks later, not to whom, but where. I got one of those text messages. I live in Croydon my blood was sent to Birmingham. To this day, I can't work out why, because there's black people in Birmingham. So that means there wasn't enough blood somewhere in Birmingham that a courier had to carry my, my, my blood to Birmingham. That's just shocking. And that really, um, through the pandemic, because less people gave during the pandemic, that just really made me think, you know what, Brenda, I'm going to look after myself. I'm going to make sure I eat well. I'm going to make sure I don't get colds. I keep my appointments. I make my appointments. I make sure I have enough iron. I make sure that they can get the blood they need from me. And so I became the small percentage who just make sure that they can max out their donations. Yeah, I can give three. It goes on as transfusions are used to top up to reduce anemia and also use uh, in large quantities to replace an individual um, sickle blood. And it's been described to me, because I'm not, I don't have sickle cell, but it's been described to me like a wilting flower. So somebody's got the sickle cell crisis or they need the transfusion. And when they get the, the right ethnically matched blood, it's like the flower pops back up and, and they, they begin to feel much better. Okay, so that's why it's so important. Um, then the specific um, ethnic um, groups, as I said, in the African heritage community, we got a subgroup called RO and that is 55% more likely to be found in the African heritage community. So you can see why we, we need numbers to come forward. We, we need to oversubscribe. 
because there will be always a reason somebody can't give availability. Um, we don't give the maximum anyway. Um, and just life takes place. So we need to have more people giving blood on a regular basis. And then we got here that when ethnically matched blood is not available, then it can cause delay or reduce or substituted with O negative blood. And for some people, as Shane said, for some people, they can um, have antibodies uh, and then maybe that treatment no longer becomes available. And what I would like to do, oh, um, Samuel's got his hand up. Do you want to ask the question now? There you go, Samuel. I've uh, sent your request to be unmuted. Uh, but in the meantime, you could continue. I'm not too sure. Okay. Yeah. There's, if you send the next video, uh, next slide, Michelle, I like to play this video because this just walks you through the actual blood donation process. Um, it's not long, but if we just play it. Has it got Can sound? Can you hear the sound? Right, you need to share sound also. You need to share sound. When you share the screen, there's a, a little tab that, that says share sound also. Can you hear that now? No, no. No, it's um, no. What it is when you share the screen, uh, when you share the video, there was a share sound option. Um. Let's try again then. Um. Yeah, when you share it down on the bottom left hand side, there's a little box that says share sound. That's when you share the screen. Let's see if that works. Is it on YouTube, this video? Yes. Um, if you put the link inside the chat, then I will copy it and then I can share it from my end with the sound. At the end or... It's up okay. To it's up to yourself. So, so, the, so, just quickly go through the process. Um, you would register through Give Blood, Spread Love. We have a link with the National um, NHSBT, who are the only people who can take blood. You would register with them, and then you would arrange a appointment at your convenience so somewhere local to you you normally put your postcode in and then you see what's available and then you book your appointment and the maximum it should take is an hour the actual blood donation no more to five to eight minutes they try to process you as quickly as possible but the first stage is you fill out a health questionnaire then you speak to a nurse um, and they go through the questionnaire with you. And then if everything's okay on the questionnaire, you're given an iron test where they prick your finger and a drop of blood goes into a solution. And if your hemoglobin is okay, it needs to be slightly above average, but if it's okay, then they invite you to a chair to give um, blood. They ask you which arm you would prefer if you, have a, if you know which arm is easier to get a vein. Uh, and, and then they have one attempt in order to um, get, use the needle to get the blood out. Um, it's, for me, it's just a scratch. Um, I know some people have a uh, phobia about needles and a lot of people who are blood donors don't have a great love for needles, but they do it for the greater good. And the nurses are quite good. They do it day in, day out. So they're very good at um, finding the, 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 the vein and trying to make it as pain-free as possible. Um, I think a paper cut 
hurts more than um, the actual um, blood donation um, process. Once you've donated just under a pint, they also take a couple of uh, samples to do tests and to make sure um, your blood is fit to give to um, someone else because obviously the person who's receiving the blood is very vulnerable so they have to make sure that that blood is right for them and so they test it and then afterwards you're welcome to have uh, a treat such as uh, biscuits or crisp in a drink and uh, make sure you feel okay they ask you to sit for 10 minutes before you leave the center um, following covid um, everything is wiped down and clean and they continue to do that um, <clears throat> and the process is um, i would say relatively quite simple um, what is great about it is as i said getting the text message knowing that you've helped an individual and you've helped their family it's a great what we call a halo feeling um, that you've really made an impact on somebody else's life and you don't need to know them you just need to know that you've done something and you know depends on how you, your approach to it is you know if would you be prepared to receive blood if so why wouldn't you be prepared to give blood? Okay, if you can, if the if you meet all the NHS rules. Now the question came up: when can you donate? If you're a first-time donator, you can start donating from the age of 17. If you're a first-time donator, you can make your first donation at 65. If you're already donating, then you can go past the age of 65. So that's how it works. Um, when you fill out a, a questionnaire or register, all those questions will be asked and you need to be able to tick all, I think there's 10 questions and you need to be able to tick all 10 and then you can go on to, to register. And that's how it works basically. Um, would you like to give the next slide, Michelle? By the way, I found a YouTube video, so I could. Oh, play can it. you play it? Um, I could. Um, I could play it um, at the end or at the end of this presentation. I don't know. It's up to yourself. Uh, I'd rather you play it now. It's not long. Okay. I just okay. want people to have a mental visual what it, the donation process looks like. Okay, well, no, not a problem. Let me, um, you are, Michelle is sharing. So Michelle could unshare the screen. And, um, right, let me go and find it first. Uh, get it ready. Appointment is the right okay i think i'm ready to go let me close one or two tabs uh what am i gonna close that one da, 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 da. yeah i'm good to go okay let's share the screen da, 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 da. here we go spring spring clean your motor with no, that's not, that's not the one. Let me <laughs> let me. I've got too many music videos on. Right, let me go back in it. Let me uh, just bear with me. Um, right, go back into. The... And also for me, the question is: if you could donate, why not? Why why wouldn't you donate if you had the opportunity to save lives? Right. Okay. We are rocking and rolling now. Let's do it. And is the best way to arrange your donation as it's easier and will save you time. Before you give blood, you should eat regular meals, drink, plen drink plenty of fluids and avoid any vigorous exercise. We aim to ensure that your whole donation journey lasts no more than one hour from your planned arrival time. When you arrive, you should give your completed donor health check questionnaire to the receptionist. You'll be given our welcome leaflet to read, as well as 500 milliliters of water to drink, which will aid your well-being during and after your donation. When your name is called, you'll be taken for your private health screening. 
You'll be asked some confidential questions and your hemoglobin levels will be tested. This only takes a moment and is done by taking a small blood sample from your finger. If all is well, after a short wait, you'll be invited to a donation chair. A cuff will be put on your upper arm to maintain a small amount of pressure during your donation and your arm will be cleaned before the needle is inserted. Your donation will normally take around 5 to 10 minutes to complete. Once you reach the full 470 milliliter donation, the needle will be removed and a sterile dressing will be secured on your arm. We'll also give you a card with some important care advice to take home with you. You'll then be able to go and enjoy the refreshment area where drinks and snacks are available. You should relax here for at least 15 minutes and have at least two drinks to stay properly hydrated. After that, you can book your next donation appointment to keep saving lives with your generosity. Book your appointment to donate. Visit blood.co.uk today. Save a life. Give blood. Right, there you go. Um, so how simple is that? And that link will also be on, on the YouTube um, when it's uploaded. That will be one of many links that will be on the YouTube um, channel. Yeah. So that's 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 pretty simple procedure for something that could save somebody's life or improve their lives. Now, as, as somebody who goes out into the community and tries to recruit people, and my philosophy is if I get a what I call a hard no, I'm not there to persuade them. If somebody says no, it's not something I'm interested in doing. I might ask them is there a particular reason and if they want to tell me they tell me if they don't I move on okay I'm really there to try to persuade the ones who are 50 50 who are unsure and want to know a little bit more about the process because they're more likely to keep their appointment I don't want somebody just to sign up to never turn up yeah I want them to sign up to turn up yeah because there's no point yeah and there is resistance in our community and there are very good reasons and maybe very justified um, because of inequalities in the health system and suspicions and poor experiences of the system uh, and those are leg legitimate reasons but there's also very good reasons why we should give um, and that is I see it as this piece of community work is a discrete piece of work where I'm donating for my community and as I said back in 1989 when I was in my 20s casual don't really didn't really understand the significance of what I was doing yeah now to find out 46 47 blood donation the significance of what I do has made me, um, as I got older, really sharper about taking care of myself and keeping my appointments and really wanting to one day be able to go in to a donation centre and give the nod. You know that nod we sometimes do as a community, even if we don't know each other. Yeah, I would really love to do that four, five, six times rather than just do it maybe once in a while, yeah? And I did ask a question. I haven't gone into the details, the finer details of um, what you need to um, do to register, because I think you can look at that once you look at the form, and that's a private thing. That's something you would go through and tick yourself. But I always ask the nurses, you know, are you seeing more of us come coming through? And they say trickles. Mm, it's getting better, but it could be better. And I said, well, why do other groups seem to do it better than us? And one of their answers was, they see their parents donate, and so when they reach seventeen, they think it's the normal thing to do. And I'll just end on one story that just I just you know can't. There was a young woman in the queue, occupied on her phone, just totally memorized on the phone. And the nurses is trying to go through the questionnaire with her. And she was just, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. On one hand doing her text thing. 
got her onto the seat, asked, you know, which arm does she want? She says that one, just texting, going through her name and everything. And she continues to text, okay? She's having her donation done. She's doing the texting and stuff still on her phone. She leaves the center. I drive down Acre Lane, stop outside McDonald's on the Zebra Crossing, if you know it. And she's still texting. And I just thought to myself, this young lady is not more, she's, she's younger than 21. And what she's done is just made it look effortless. Just effortless. Whatever was occupying her on that phone was more important than the donation, but yet she made the donation. And I just, I just thought she's more casual than I was at 21. But she, I don't know her story. I don't know her, what motivated her to do it, but she made it look effortless. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see our young people model that effortlessness. It's something to do. It is the norm. I want to help my community. Um, so that's my message as a blood donor. Um, tell If you can't donate, Tell the youngsters in your family, the niece, the nephews, the grandsons, the granddaughters, tell them about it, normalize it. Yeah. And also get away from this language that I often hear. I have bad blood. Don't tell me you have bad blood. Tell me what it is that causes you not to donate. And it may be because I have antibodies for malaria. But that is a reason for the NHS. That's not bad blood. That is a reason. Yeah. And so we debunk myths and stop perpetuating um, stories about bad blood and things like that. I know there are very personal reasons why people won't give. And I respect that. But I think we should be factual in what we're saying. And um, Shane said it, and uh, other people say, you know, is be careful with our language. You know, the language has changed. Um, sickle cell is a blood disorder. And I think it makes a lot of difference by then saying disease. It, it, it allows people to start to think about what is it we're talking about. Yeah, so, you know, I'm trying to keep it short um, and, and to the point. And, you know, my remit is how many people from this, there's maybe 72 people on here. Oh, there's, what, 93. I would want to know how many people will sign up after having their awareness um, raised, how many people will change that awareness into action. And so that's where I come from as a uh, volunteer for the Sickle Cell Society. And so that's me. Uh, can I just say, Brenda, again, speaking from the heart, it was quite sensational. Brenda, can I just break down some, some stats? You have donated, I believe, 47 times and women could only donate maximum three times per year. That's correct, yeah? yeah. And I'll tell you something, it would be more oh, if, <laughs> if, if a certain person in my life didn't tear my letters up when they used to come into my house because they didn't believe in blood donation. Wow. And I only saw that letter torn up by accident because at that time I wasn't conscious about making the appointment. I waited for them to contact me. And I was so hurt that this person would do this because they didn't believe in donations. Yeah. And I was just by accident, I saw it in the bin. Um, and so it, personally, I, I know there's people in the community who don't believe in it, but I believe in it. I'm also a STEM donate, I donated STEMs and that ended up in the USA, and I still can't understand why. Um, you know, we can do it. We can help ourselves. 
there's this this discrete piece of action that we can do. So um, it would have been more. I would have done 55 by now. But still, um, yeah, I I know, but still, 47, I mean, crikey, I mean. And I'm here, and I'm well, and nothing's happened to me. Actually, actually, I'm going to, once again, Denise, I do sincerely apologise, but I'm going to take one question from the chat that's going to, and I'm going to redirect it to you, Brenda. It was from Emmanuel, I'm trying to find it. Um, I can't find it, but what he was basically asking, the question is, how do you remain so fit and healthy after giving uh okay i found it how do you give so much blood 40 plus 47 times while maintaining the healthy proper amount of blood does the blood regenerate itself it does it does and to be to be quite honest i think i don't know the percentage of people who may feel faint afterwards but me I give the blood, yes, the advice is 10, 15 minutes, but you know, I pick up a drink and then I move on. Yeah, Um, and nothing's happened to me. I mean, you've got to be sensible. So I don't fast when I know I'm going to give. I'm gonna have a breakfast. I don't do any hard workouts after I've donated blood. I do it before, yeah. I'm sensible about doing things like that, okay? How I keep, Um, I'm a keen cyclist yeah so I keep fit in that way I eat my greens I make sure that my iron because the most nervous bit is when they do the finger prick and I'm just there saying blood go down go down go down go down go down and it goes down and they invite me to the chair many don't people who donate sometimes they their iron levels are not where they they don't um, get quite get the iron level and to see some of the donors their disappointment they're so committed to giving and so psyched up to give and then they're told look we're sorry on this occasion you can't give but thank you for giving and they've told how they can increase their iron levels and things and so on on one side is the people who come forward to donate really want to donate and make a donation um, but sometimes you're told you can't and sometimes that's a good thing because it would tell you that something maybe you need to do something to increase your iron levels and that's not uncommon yeah I've had that on one or two occasions I listen to what they tell me to do I read the leaflet and make sure that my iron levels are 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 are, you know good so that I can donate um so that shouldn't put people off um I hope we get some people who sign up after um, this uh, DJ Harvey and like everybody else, I thank you for putting this platform, well, offering this platform um, to talk about such a um, important issue as all the issues are. But um, I think this is something the community can action. Yeah, well, as I said, um, all the links will be on the YouTube uploaded video in the morning um, and certainly links where you can donate um, accordingly. Now, thank you very much, Brenda. Um, Yeah, magnificent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Now, I have sent um, a request for for Samuel to unmute and um, have his say. haven't had much response, but... Before we go to Noel, we are going to go to Denise, but after Noel, we're going to have a live speaker, and it will be Dr. Ogbonna. He has messaged me, and he will be coming on after Noel. But before we go to Noel, let's go over to Denise over there in Toronto. What's the time there in Toronto, uh, Denise? You're muted. You're muted. It's 5.09 in Toronto. 5.09. Right okay. So 5.09 in Toronto. What is the Zoom chat saying at uh, 10, 10 09 in the UK? <laughs> it's almost our bedtime. I know. We're just not even having dinner yet here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. From Kiki. Thank you, Brenda. We also spoke about this in our last meeting, Sickle Cell Winning Group. 
we all need to spread words and encourage our friends and family. Um, I work for NHSBT event team and I also donate and doing donations. I do a video and send it out and encourage more people to give blood. And I am a mother of a sickle cell young warrior. That was from Kiki. And um, Emmanuel was asking, how do you give so much blood 40 plus times while maintaining a healthy proper amount of blood? Um, we spoke about that regenerating. Um, Naomi's got a long, Naomi's went to um, come on, but she's got some um, sound issues. So she's left a comment in there. Uh, do you want to read that out, DJ Harvey? I'd, I'd rather leave it to the expert yourself. To the expert? <laughs> okay, I'm looking for it actually because I just lost it. Okay, I've got it in front of me. Shall I read it? Go ahead, thank you. Right, it's a bit of a long one. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, right, basically, Naomi says, Sorry, my signal is struggling, but I'm a sickle cell warrior. I live in Huddersfield where there isn't a large sickle cell community. I lived in Manchester for 12 years and the difference between the two were worlds apart, yet only 26 miles apart. The fundamental training given to nurses, medical staff, needs to be more than 30, more than a 30 minute topic during a lesson. I have had two strokes, two hip replacements, reconstructed shoulder, all as a result of sickle cell. I have been having red cell exchanges for the last five years due to being a bad sickler and a parent to both carriers. Um, this is eight units every six to eight weeks. This is why it is so important to, to donate blood. My mum was told in the 80s I would not make it to 18. I am now 37 years old. So I can't imagine the emotional journey she has been on. We must listen to the voices of carers too. I have always worked and nodded my head too many times regarding the research. Gutted I can't speak today, but I am more than happy to discuss and share my journey to anyone um, that's from Naomi and again Naomi if you want to leave a link or some sort of direct communication send it to me and obviously I'll put it on the YouTube uploaded video that will be there in the morning um, okay wow 10 past 12 um, oh Portia uh, thank you very much Denise um, Portia good evening hello hello there can you hear me loud and clear Right, I'm actually Naomi's mum. Wow. Um, okay. And thank you, Nai, for saying that, what you said. But I just like to speak as a as a parent of um, of a warrior and um, just to say how how times have changed, but not enough, if you know what I mean. Yes. Um it's true when Naomi was born, they said actually they said that I wouldn't have a past sixteen. I'd be lucky to have a past sixteen. Mm -hmm. And so I feel really blessed that I'm going to have her till she's about 70, 80. Um, mm. But the, the key thing for me is that, you know, during during the time where we lived in Birmingham, West Bromwich, Manchester and, and Huddersfield, we've had to, it's been a continual fight to get protocols in place, protocols acknowledged to get the right kind of treatment and support for Naomi. Um, and it continues to this day. Nai has red cell exchanges, which have transformed her life. But the issue is that if there's even a minor complication, A&E departments just don't seem to acknowledge the potential risk and the changes. So, and I hope Nai doesn't mind me saying this, but when she's presented at A&E with a potential blood clot following the exchange, they've treated her like an idiot. <laughs> um, you know, she's, she's, she's lived, lived all her life with sickle cell. And the clinicians have spoken to her as if, well, you know, this isn't a crisis, you know. 
and then sent her away from a &E with a flea in her ear. And it's only when we got the hospital in Manchester to intervene and say, actually, you should be you should be checking for deep vein th thrombosis and, and so on and so forth, that they actually sat up and thought, oops. And it's I'm sure there are a lot of warriors out there with similar experiences where their lived experience isn't taken into account. But fortunately, I think it would be good to know the experience of other of the families of the support they get from the central hubs or the regional hubs rather. Is that approach working? I mean, for us, it, it's um, it's a good fallback or backstop in as much as there's a centre of excellence in the region. And I guess, you know, there'll be ups and downs and variations across the country. But it means that we've got a reference point to go back to when our local facilities in our local areas just don't get it or they don't um, they don't work to the right standard or adopt the right or practice the right protocols. So I'd be interested um, to see how well, particularly if, if there's any feedback from the sickle, sickle cell society about how that might be working. But I'd also like to to say that we also need to look at the support that's needed for the siblings, the carers and the, and the wider family networks of warriors because they care too. And it's like, how do we acknowledge that? How do we get their needs and, and, and uh, concerns addressed and supported? But I'd just like to thank um, the Sickle Cell Societies and the groups that exist, particularly in the North, because we, we, we seem like poor cousins sometimes to you guys down south. And a lot of that is down to us actually pulling our socks up and doing something about it, which hopefully this, this debate tonight will stimulate that action within the community. Um, but yeah, it's, it'll be, yeah, I, I think I'll leave it there at that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, what I'll do, I'll ask Michelle, yeah, Michelle, in response to that, I can see you put a comment inside. Yeah, there. thank you so much, Portia and Naomi, for, for, for sharing that and, and adding to the debate, because this is supposed to be a, a debate two-way. Yeah, what I put in the comment was absolutely what you've described is far too common, and that was what's been captured in the no one's listening report which is why I you know urge everyone to, to read it share it and also respond and um, respond by writing to your MPs and um, there's a template letter um pro forma also available on the sickle cell website because a bit like you know the blood donation issue you know we do also need to take control and power and get people to listen. But no one's listening report has been effective in that manner. Um, unfortunately, um, it came about, I mean, the report was overdue anyway, but um, the sad death of Nathan Evan Smith, who was actually in hospital, he's had a complication from you know, another, um, uh, another operation unrelated to sickle cell, but because of his sickle cell went into crises was phoning from a hospital bed and um, 999 and the call handler said well where are you you know he was already in in, in hospital um and sadly died and that death should not have taken place so that and all the other cases that were described no one's listening report exactly how you described Portia you know particularly at the A&E people's pain not being believed, particularly um, black men um, and young black men, um, you know, presenting as being healthy and strong in appearance and being accused of being, you know, opioid seekers. But we're using that report to lobby change with the MPs. And um, we've got Janet Dabby, who's the chair of the Sickle Cell and Thalassemia or Party Parliamentary Group recommendations have been made very clearly and um, to the NHS, Department of Health, NICE, and we're holding them to account for those changes to take place. Um, so again, you know, it's not enough, it's not fast enough, um, we're behind the curb, um, but we are using, and um, particularly the report to say, 
you know, enough is enough. Um, Nathan Evan Smith was only one death. There was Tommy Neres, another death. Um, you, they shouldn't be happening. You know, once is bad enough, but but sadly, it's more than once. But um, yeah, read the report, um, contact your MPs, and we need to say, no, we're not putting up with this anymore. Enough is enough. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much, Michelle, again. And um, thank you, Portia. Um, okay, I can say at this 20 past 10, uh, this will be extended. We are uh, going to extend for obvious reasons. We have Noel coming up now. And we've also got two other speakers after Noel. We've got Dr. Ogbonna and we have Samuel who I've been communicating with. So um, straight after Noel, we have... Um, to other speakers um, and then we will be extending uh, this very very stimulating debate tonight on sickle cell disorder mr. Noel you have been a very very patient man good evening good evening can you hear me loud and clear sir oh that's good that's good yeah I've been I've been doing some stuff here typing and doing some writing I had to do yeah, it's, it is late, so you need to extend it for another time. It's got to be extended, yeah. don't worry about that. So I want to give a brief talk about myself and how sickle cells affected me. But before I do that, I want to talk about Bevan Smith. The hospital he was in was my hospital, North Middlesex. And he had, a, it was a gallbladder stent he had put in. I had the same thing done. And it, he, he came back in wasn't feeding well. And he, he had to ask them for oxygen. The, the key thing is, though, the consultant didn't know he was there. The consultant, when he found out, he cried. He said, if he knew he was there, he'd have got the blood. In. He already, all he did was an exchange transfusution, a few units in it, would have, it would have sorted him out completely. And this is the sort of thing we got to deal with. I had the same, op same operation, same procedure, but with me, I was more vocal. It was a different, different consultant, no issues at all. It wasn't just Bevan. A lot of people have died in that same hospital, and we always knew it was going to happen because of the way they treat us. There was a Greek girl, but she was white. And she had full sickle cell. She came in. She had an oxygen at March. She had to carry an oxygen tank because of her lungs. They gave her medication, which is painkillers, put her in a side room and left her there. She died. So there was a big hoo-ha about chest crisis and all that. So they were all right for a little bit. It all dies down. These are the struggles we've got to put up with. The thing about opioids, you go in there with sickle pain, they, they will automatically think that you're addicted. I get it all the time. So let me talk about my experience now from the very beginning. I was born in 1966 on an RAF base, Holton Camp, Wendover. My dad came in 1960, my mum came in 61 from Jamaica. At the age of four, I was having problems with my teeth. His mum took me to Stoke Mandeville Hospital, the now famous Paralympic Hospital. And the doctor said, oh, we can take him out. It's not a problem, not an issue. And my dad said, my dad didn't trust him. He said, look, nothing wrong with him, bring him come. But my mum listened to the doctors. You know how we listened to them? She believed and they gave her a bed next to me. I woke up with four doctors holding me down and there was a drip in my arm. I realised now it was giving me a blood transfusion. And I thought, and my mum, it, it was a big hoo-ha at the time. The West Indian incubator was up in arms. I go in normal, come out sick. And one of my dad's friends said to him, if that was my son, I'd cut the doctor's throat. But one of the doctors actually said to my mum, you've got nine children, there's nine of us, after the last one, what does it matter if you lose one? And to them, sickle cell, they never heard of it. Coming from Jamaica, all the children were healthy. So I'm the <laughs> last one to get it. They didn't understand genetics and how it works. So they explained to him what happened, and they said, well, look, you know, we'll take care of him for the rest of his living days. We'll keep, we're getting better. And the hospital administrator said to my mum, they didn't have much drugs to give a four-year-old. So they, they, they pacified my parents by saying they didn't have much drugs to give a four-year-old. We're getting better. That to me, that's medical negligence. So after I got better, she took me back to the RF hospital where I was born, and the Indian doctor there went mad. He said, what have they done to him? Because visibly I was different. He said, just... <clears throat> He phoned him and he said, you're supposed to test the child before you give them the anaesthetic. So up to this day, we don't know if, if it was the fact, if I had a reaction to the anaesthetic, then they tested my blood. Like this was 1970, 72. So no, it was, no, it's 1970, sorry, 1970. So I got over it and my parents just thought I got, they used some drugs on me, I got over it. And I had this, I was a bit sickly sometimes. When I was six, someone came to an education department to my house I finished primary school as normal. And the guy goes, oh, because he's got this condition, we've got to find him a school as a matron. 
it's a boarding school. It's 15 miles from home. We pick him up on a Monday, bring him back on a Friday. And out of the blue, he says, I'm dunce. My mum thinks, dunce, but it, now he's only six, they'll sort it out. So my first day in school, I got called a nigger. I was odd one out, didn't, didn't know I was different. That's when I realised I was different. And um, the first night in, in school, I cried for my mum. I'm only six. Second night, I was all right. So I got used to it. And the first problem I had was when I was walking down the corridor, and this boy punched me in the back. Turned out he was 16. So I get on the phone, reverse the charges. I'm not quite seven to ring my mum. My dad comes with my, with my brother. Headmaster said for the boy. And my, dad, my brother said, he didn't look right. So my dad took one look at him and I was, hang on, this is a school for handicapped children. Headmaster said, yeah, we don't like to use that word, we call them slow learners. So what they'd done, to, what they'd actually done, what this guy said I was, I was dunce, what he was alluding to, they would put me in a school for children who were educated subnormal. And this is, big, this is a big thing in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Black children were put in these schools oversubscribed because it was deemed as being retarded under the banner of eugenics. So um, I got through school. Well, the next problem I had was when I was 12. I'm in a playground and this woman, support worker, I played with my mates and we were told to go in. So I'm away and I, walk, I sort of like run behind the wall, not to get away from her, I've done nothing wrong. She pulls me into her like this, beats me up repeatedly, calls me a black bastard. So I run away from school, they bring me back. My mum phones me that night. So my parents come, get involved, take me out of the school. And they say, well, we want to <clears throat> get him out of there completely. So they sent me to a school on a part-time basis around the corner from my special school. I was the odd one out. I got called nigger. I didn't like it. So I played true and I'm going back. <clears throat> my class teacher bullied me. Noah, can I pause you there? Can I pause yeah, you there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, could you please be mindful that this is going to be uploaded <laughs> onto YouTube? And could you please be mindful of the language, please? Yeah, well, it's what it is, isn't it? Is they, they, they find this faithful now, but they, they've been calling us that for centuries. Anyway, let me continue. So I got over that. And um, what I really realised, because they took me to this secondary school on a part-time basis, right? I realised that because I can learn. I actually know what's going on. But because I was bullied, I didn't like it. I ended up staying in my school. I didn't realise at the time they had no curriculum. So I didn't learn anything. Uh, Deputy Administrator bullied me for four years because she thought that, that individual got the sack. They must have sacked her. She bullied me because she thought I was lying. And I told my mum what this woman said to me one day. No more telling lies. She said, don't worry about it, typical Jamaican. Yeah, so we were bullied me for four years. I didn't know what multiplication was. We had one lesson on it when I was 16. They were never taught again. So I left school with nothing because I had low self-esteem, lack of confidence. And the only work I could get was labouring. Now, if you've got a sickle cell, you can't work that sort of job. I was lifting up wheelbarrows full of cement. For one day I lifted up a railway sleeper, it triggered a crisis, I ended up in hospital. I had painful injections of fluids. I got over it. I want to jump back a little bit because when I was in school, I went swimming and, and I had a crisis. And my parents were told that there's a matron there to take care of me. She didn't know what to do. So she had to ring, ring my parents. It was a good three hours before they come. I get home and get painkillers. So I'm in agony for three hours. Once I got the painkillers, I was all right. So there was a lot of neglect and misunderstanding around a condition called sickle cell. So after I started working and realised I did I needed education, I started evening classes, maths and English. Yeah, so I... Eventually, I got started to get confidence. Passed my first exam, which was a written exam. I was in my 20s, I think, and it was just basic maths. I was doing a YTS at the same time. So I was doing a work placement at the same time as a labourer and cleaning jobs. Then I got on a YTS scheme. And they, they taught me how to do basic repairs and stuff. The job went down. I moved to London. I get a really good job in, in the NHS. But now I'm in London. I'm more around people who understand sickle cell. I had a crisis, my crisis weren't that frequent. I was getting them once every two years. I was quite healthy and quite fit. I spent two years in, in Jamaica with my parents. So I got used to eating naturally, natural foods, herbs and stuff, seaweed, strong or sweet potato, you've got a garden picket. So I got used to that natural way of doing stuff. Didn't like the drugs at all. I didn't require blood transfusion, didn't want them anyway. So didn't want to go on that exchange program because once you start going on that, it does cause a lot of problems, iron overload. So I was reasonably healthy. So while I was working in NHS, I want to, right, the manager passed this remark, down with the ends. I can't say that word, down with the ends, right? Could I say Negro, right? That's what, and um, I thought, I better keep my mouth shut. The man bullied me for another four years. When I complained, they sat me on the spot, called it redundancy. So after that, I went to university, did an access course. 
And this is cause and effect now, I'm pushing myself a lot harder because I want to get through this and get back on path. I get a problem in my hip, my left hip, it's a crisis. Eventually it starts to heal up. Went for an x-ray, it's fine, don't worry about it. So I get a place at university, go to see a doctor again. He said, yeah, she said, um, just keep it mobile, it'll be all right. I didn't want to drop out. So got good, got flying colors of this access course after they told me I was done. So after I developed this problem, it got better during the summer. Got a place at City University. And three months in, it starts to grind. I thought, this doesn't feel right, it's hurting. They put me on crutches, went for an x-ray. They said, you've got no cartilage left. You need replacement. I was 32, I think. I said, I'm, I'm too young for that. So I took, what they told me, to, they told me to keep it mobile. It was the wrong advice. But she told me to rest my hip, let it heal properly. So I was on crutches now. I took, dropped out of university, took three years out, thinking it will heal, but of course it doesn't heal. Now I didn't realize at the time I was dabbing my shoulders, damaging the shoulders, similar problem to the hips. And the consultant says to me, you should be off them by now, you should be careful and go the other way. But she never said no more than that. She should have x-rayed it and said, well, look, you know, People have problems with their shoulders, they get necrosis. When I went for the x-ray, my shoulders were gone. I had my left shoulder replaced about two years ago. So I went back, took, took me eight years to get my degree. Then when I came, and I'm, I had the hip replacement, I had to have it done. Um, I think I had that done. Yeah, I had it done, went back to university, got the degree, and I was walking on the right one too much. That went funny, necrosis. So I, the woman that operated on me was Sarah Muralhead, um, the Queen's surgeon, who put it on the Queen's mum. And she was the best surgeon at the time. Because I left North Middlesex, I wasn't happy with it, went to Whittington, saw her, and I thought I'd better let her do it. Because at my local hospital, they wanted to give, give me one off the shelf, which was plastic. They don't last more than five years. She gave me a titanium hip. It doesn't require cement. It was new technology. I've had it about 22 years. Both of them, no problems. So I was grateful for that. Just doing that research and making sure I'm in, the, I'm in good hands. If you listen to the NHS, they'll give you, you know, the run of the mill person. They don't seem to have that kind of regard for us. We, we like, you know, we're like everybody else. They tarnish us with the same brush. So you've got to do your research. So I had the hip done, went back, got my degree, and I did a master's in education to train to be a teacher. And that was the only time that my local authority said, well, let's see if you've got dyslexia. So the year before that, on the access course, I did another access course. And the woman says to me, one of my teachers says, I think you're dyslexic. So she arranged a test for me, and it partial test said, yeah, you're dyslexic. Your processing speed is slow, sometimes below average, but your verbal reasoning skills are quite high. So I finished my degree now. I got a tutor while I was on the degree. Then they arranged for me to see a psychologist. The guy gives me a test. He says, you're mildly dyslexic. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute. I've been, I've been self-studying for the past like 15 years. And he didn't say anything about it. So I spoke to him recently. He said, if you've been studying, you take a test for dyslexia, it's going to make a difference because you'd have corrected some of the problems you had when you was in school. And this is why I've got issues with the test. When I left school, if they tested me, then I would have been classed as severely dyslexic. I couldn't spell. I couldn't write. I couldn't add up. The comprehension didn't have, was non-existent. Having been at university now, learning how to do things properly, I applied to do a master's. I got the test and I got a tutor. I got through the master's. No, but I had a crisis. Now, I told them I had sickle cell. And I don't want to take your time off. Should be, should be all right. The mentor goes, yeah, Christ, I know what that is. So I'm thinking, I'm all right. It's, it's all good. I had a crisis. I did activity with the kids and I shouldn't have done it. So I took a week off my placement. I was in, night over, I was in hospital overnight. I got a painkiller injection called um, Oxynorm. They changed it from Pefidine. It used to be Pefidine because Pefidine was um, short acting. But there were issues with it. So they put me on this drug called Oxynorm. And it did work. So I took the week off. I asked the guy at university, could I have some extra time to do my project because I've been in hospital? He said, no, point blank. And he knows I've got a disability. So that's how my sickle cell has worked against me. Right? They, don't, they don't understand it. They don't recognize it. They don't want to understand it. I finished the, the, the master's and I took them to a court, took them to court. The problem was the solicitor went bust. I now realize I could take them to court myself because they have to make reasonable adjustments. I would have got 6,000. I got bullied on the course by this mentor. I found out later that he bullied another girl. She was from um, Nigeria, grade A student, but she had a strong accent. He failed her and she took him through the internal procedures. Because she was a grade A student, she knew what she was doing. And they, in, the, in the end, they ruled in her favor, paid her 9,000, I think he resigned. They told her to come back and do the course. So when you're going through 
these sort of issues and having sickle cell and being a black man. Not only have you got sickle cell, you've got racism to fight. And many of us have never been schooled or educated. Even people that go to normal schools are leaving school without proper qualifications. So I was in a documentary called Subnormal, a British scandal. That's on BBC One, iPlayer. And it was about the subnormal schools they did to us in the 60s and the 70s, how we've been systematically, willfully and deliberately set up to fail. You go into the workplace, you get, you get hit with institutional racism. You don't know what to do, so you keep your mouth shut. The problem just co compounds itself. And so when I complained in my workplace, they said, yeah, we know he's racist. And six months later, they sat me and called it redundancy. Now, throughout that process, I heard him say, get rid of him and get an Asian. So there's a, there is a hierarchy of racism. What Diane Abbott was saying, she might have came at, came at it from the wrong angle. But during the 60s and the 70s, when we came from the Caribbean, even though I was born here, they put they gave, put black kids in these schools and they gave the Asian kids remedial lessons. If you watch the documentary, it's all highlighted. So you can see those structures in society today. The Asians have a better foot in than we do. And we've been there longer than them. It's because of our race, we're still suffering. So I'm gonna post some links um, later on when well, like DJ was saying about the petition that I've got and all that. It's about my journey struggling with sickle cell, being a black man with sickle cell, struggling in the system, fighting for my rights. They don't believe us. Whenever we say something, telling the truth, they don't believe us at all. So that's, that's all part of my journey and, and the struggle that I've had growing up in the UK. And um, when I lived in Jamaica, I got used to the holistic way of doing things. This is why I don't like having blood transfusions. I had to have it when I had my left shoulder done. And they put me on this machine, they took out 10 units of blood one time, put back 10 units, different, different donor blood. It turns out I had a reaction to it. The blood was useless. So oh, the right one's bad, at least doing so, I'm debating whether to have, how to do it, go about it. If they can give me part way exchanges. When I had the hip done, they did like three units a week, one week, next week, another three units, they take out and put back in. Prefer that way rather than the machine one go because I developed antibodies, which I never had before. Wow, that's an amazing story, sir. Amazing. I mean, mm. wow. That is a journey. That is a journey. Yeah. I know. What I should say is I've also written a book. When I was in school, I was writing in my special school, but they didn't cater for it. So it after going back to university and having this corner again, I wrote a children's book called Jake's Ellen Adventures. I've written three more scripts. I'm currently doing writing. I've got a diploma in creative writing. I've been studying ever since. So that's my, that's my story. Well, all the speakers are very much encouraged to um, send me the links and it will be on YouTube and it will be there for all to see, all to click and all to um, uh, gain more um, in-depth knowledge. Uh, Noel, Samuel, good evening. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? You are the last speaker of the evening. Thank you very much. Um, just want to quickly say thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to you, DJ Harvey, for putting this on. Uh, Michelle, Brenda, Shane, Dr. Obano, Esheo, that is fantastic what you were telling us. I appreciate it, I appreciate it. I am going to try and not take up too much of you guys' time. Um, excuse me, I'm a sick self sufferer. Uh, my story is long, so I won't, I won't go into depth. What I basically wanted to come on and say is, uh, as you can see from the profile picture, I have a production company called Unfiltered London. I'm trying, I've been trying for the last 10 years to do a documentary uh, around sickle cell to raise awareness. So this is for schools, corporate companies, and hospitals and care services. I have everything I need to a degree, um, which is I've got cameras, I've got um, lighting, I've got everything like that. I need a few more participants and I need money to put this on. I need, <clears throat> um, excuse me, my production budget is roughly 15,000 pounds, roughly. Uh, I've got more numbers that I can clarify for everybody. So what I'm asking is if you go to Unfiltered London, take a look at the last documentary I did, which was called I See You which is around COVID and systemic racism. Um, you can see the caliber of work that we do. Shane is a very good friend of mine. He's my sickle cell brother. Uh, I've known him for all his life. Um, and I've just started working with him with the supplements and the teas and the CMOS and everything. So I can attest to what he's saying. 
because previously I was going in hospital, going to our medical day unit, and I was telling people, drink more water, exercise, meditate, take this, take that. But it fell on deaf ears. And obviously the doctors don't like you telling the patient about holistic or other methods. They want to keep you on the pharmaceuticals because it's money for them. They're getting paid off of it. So obviously that awareness, a lot of our young sicklers don't know. Um, obviously our, old, our older sickle, sickle cell sufferers will know this and obviously moving over as Shane attested to, he's started to do this through his education and learning. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's really what I wanted to say. Um, if you go to Unfiltered London, please subscribe and please check out our previous work. And if you are interested in being part of the documentary and willing to donate or know any ways of me getting money, I'm going to try and do crowdfunding. I'm sending a letter to my MP and I'm just hoping for more and more bits and pieces. When you look at the last documentary that we did, which is called ICU, like I said before, on unfiltered.london, we self-funded that. We did it backwards, but it's won awards and it was screened at a Prince Charles Theatre in London last year, May. So it's, it's received a lot of accolade and we did that off our own backs. So you can imagine if we had funding and money, what we could do with the sickle cell project that I'm trying to put on. Um, that's really all I've got to say. If there's any questions, please ask. I will put my details in the group but if you just go to unfiltered.london, that's where you can find me. Well, Sammy, what I would say is that um, if you could um, s uh, uh, message me directly, I'll put um, my email address and, um, and the phone number in the chat. If you want to send me those links, um, especially the GoFundMe one, um, I will post links on the YouTube uploaded video that I feel is going to be beneficial to all sickle cell so all personal contact um, links and um, go fund me for example making a documentary um, send it to me and when it's all uploaded it will be all there i've got a feeling there's going to be a ton of links <laughs> on the uploaded video so um no thank you very much samuel um thank you very much dj Harvey. yeah no problem Done. yeah let me right. wait for this um, thing to Denise, I think. Hold on. Uh, hey, okay, yeah. Let me mute Denise because I don't think that she, I think she might have been having a little personal conversation. Okay, I'm going to unmute you, Denise, for the very last time. Um, okay, so I'll take a couple of comments and we are going to be closing the debate. What has been going on in the Zoom chat? Mm, okay, I think it was Noel that said. Uh, Kind of like a public service announcement. June nineteenth is World Sickle Cell Day. Oh, by the so, way, while we're on that, I've been sitting here thinking about June the nineteenth. Yeah. So I'm going to put it out there to the whole platform. What about? What do you think about the BPM? Eight till ten, just for a couple of hours. Having a more relaxed debate driving people to give blood on June the 19th, raising awareness, really driving it on June the 19th, which I believe, I ain't seen a calendar, but I think someone said it was a Monday. Um, Brilliant idea. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. Let's wait for all your feedback, but I see no reason why we can't have part two on June the 19th. Denise, I apologize again. I keep interrupting you. Go on. It's okay. Um, okay. Emma, I know a few people have given thanks to Dr. Ugo and also to Brenda, uh, everyone. And Brenda has also posted the, the blood donor sheet. It's a Google document. Um, and that's in the chat. I think it will also be available after. Elaine says, wow, amazing. Uh, Elridge, that was amazing, Dr. Ogbona. Yes, and um, oops, Kai says the demographics of SE is changing, sickle cell is changing as society changes and mixed relationships 
white people with sickle cell is increasing as well. And uh, we'll uh, take one more comment. Go on, Angeek, go on. You want one more comment? Fine. Sure. Yeah, find one more. Okay. Uh, uh, so Shane said, let's definitely speak on raising the funds next time we meet. Samuel, a documentary will be empowering. They're talking about a documentary. Even, so. Excellent. Okay, Denise, um, I think this is the last thank you of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, for taking everyone. comments from the chat. Yeah, Thanks no worries. Um, Eldred says, June the 19th is Juneteenth in the USA, recognition of freedom for black people in the USA in 1865. So you know what? Let's do it. Let's reconvene on June the 19th. I think it's absolutely appropriate. Can I just say to all the speakers, um, Michelle, Merle, Shane, Noel, Brenda, and our subsequent uh, speakers, um who has come on the bpm this evening i'd like to say thank you all we are going to reconvene i think that's already decided on the 19th um the bpm is going to continue when we sh uh, close the recording we will continue for another half hour which means 11 30. but in the meantime i'd like to say thank you one and all it you will be able to see it again in the morning it will be uploaded and once you get it share it share it and share it alike once again thank you very much until the next time we will see you on june the 19th but somewhere around june the 19th the next bpm debate will be on domestic violence so once again the last call is if you know anybody um, or somebody who is in that particular field or somebody who has suffered themselves it could be you suffered domestic violence and you want to tell your story then please contact the bpm directly on the email address and phone number but for now the bpm says good night and until the next bpm debate um take care and we will see you soon